Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real with Bob and Stacey. You're joining us for our Leaders and Legends segment. Our guest today is Charlie Harari, business executive, author, and speaker. Welcome to the show, Charlie. Thanks so much. It's so great to be on your show. So I want to give everybody some background on Charlie. He's an author and internationally known speaker sought out for his lectures, seminars, and keynote addresses on business intelligence, performance management, and personal empowerment. He is the Senior Director of Capital Markets at RxR Realty, a multi-billion dollar real estate company based in New York. He hosts a weekly radio show on NSN Radio Network and the Unlocking Greatness podcast. Upon its launch in 2015, Unlocking Greatness made it to the top 10 on iTunes new and noteworthy business podcast list. Harari is an adjunct clinical professor of management and entrepreneurship at Sim School of Business at Yeshiva University. He received his JD from Columbia Law, where he was awarded the James Kent Scholar and Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar. By the way, anybody just tuning in, you can check out his website at unlockinggreatnessbook.com. So my first question for you is tell us all about your book, Unlocking Greatness. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, and such an honor to be on your show, and thanks for your kind words. So Unlocking Greatness really is a research-based approach towards how one becomes the person they're meant to be. You live in a world and you hear all these lines, you can be who you want to be, your mind shapes reality, anything is possible, and you sort of go, oh, I think that's true, it sounds true, but how does it actually work? And so I wrote the book based on the years of teaching, the business school, of trying to give people the approach when you see it through the prism of science, how your mind works, your soul, practical applications, what do the Navy SEALs do, what do neurosurgeons do, to really give individuals a path to understanding the the information behind the catchphrases that we all get to hear and see so that people can actually grow and change their lives. So I know your book talks some about business culture, and I'll say, so I own a real estate company. We have 400 real estate agents, 25 staff members, and I try to do everything right when it comes to culture. I have a board of directors, which is all my real estate agents, so that they have a voice in how the companies run. I constantly survey agents. And for the most part, we always have a great company culture. But sometimes it can turn really quick, like in a particular office or uh, any part, any segment of the organization. I don't, how do you fix that and why does that happen? Great question, and it's a question that a lot of people are grappling with, is when you have people at the top working so hard to create culture, and then through the grassroots, there's some dissidence that ends up ruining for everybody else. And there's two ways to deal with it, and first, to understand it. In the book, we speak a lot about how none of us actually perceive reality. What we perceive is the perception of reality, right? We are looking at the world through a lens that we've had growing up throughout our whole lives, and it's that lens that makes us feel certain things. That's where you get two people in the room, and some people say, wow, this is amazing, and some people say, this is terrible. It's the same thing. It's just their lens is different. And many times in companies, what happens is we, we bring people in, and what we focus on is their actions. We focus on their pro- productivity, their products. And what we, we miss is their perspective. We're not keen. We're not aware. We don't watch individuals that work for us and how they see the world and how they react to situations. And many times in companies, the people that have perceptions that are negative or that are toxic end up creating a a toxic or negative environment. And even if it's coming from the top, these individuals end up ruining it for everybody else. And so how do you deal with it? The first thing is you try to deal, you try to help them. You try to identify it for them. You try to give them opportunities to grow and to see that they're seeing the world in a way that maybe it's their perception and not the reality that's causing them to have these issues. And being able to deal with it at the level of the mind and the perception really can help these individuals grow past it or give insight to management as to whether or not they are people that should be in the company, even if they're producing good results for the company. So it's so when, interesting. How do you know when, sorry, go ahead, Stace. I was just going to say it's interesting that you say that because, and this is probably just my perception, like I had a very similar situation recently and I hope that we have a company culture where like we don't give up on one another and that I feel like we're all put on earth to help each other be a better person today than we were yesterday. 
And that's a balancing act when you have somebody that's creating a negative company culture because my initial thought when I deal with something like that is I can't fix that person and get them out of the company. Like how do you balance between get rid of them out of the company because they're creating a toxic culture for everybody else to the other side of it saying, no, everybody's fixable and I can help get them to see a different perception of the entire company or situation. Right. Yeah, great question. question. You know, how, do you know, it, how do you know the difference? How do you know when it's worth investing the time and when it's not, I guess? Is... Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a great question, and, and there's two real parts to this answer. The first is the mission of the company. If you see great teams and great co- corporations and great groups, what happens to them is there's a mission that everybody buys into. The mission is set from the coach or from the owner or from the, who, the partners, and they say, we're going to do this. And what happens is mm-hmm. as that mission is clear, you get a sense as to who in the company is bought into the mission or who in the company is bought into themselves. And as mm-hmm. clear and as clear as you get to the mission, and the more you continuously reinforce it, the more the individuals that are self-focused start to emerge and show themselves. And when that starts to happen, you start to realize that people, it's not just a question of fixing people, right? Sometimes it's a question of alignment. That person could be Mm -hmm. a good person. He may be in the wrong spot. It may be just Mm -hmm. as bad for him to be there than it is for you for him to be there. And -hmm. it all comes down to one thing. It's whether or not that individual is growth-minded or are they fixed-minded. And you can sit down and figure this out. When someone's growth-minded, they may have a bad perception. They They may be in a bad place, right? They may have stuff going on in their personal lives. But when you speak to them and work with them, if you see that they're growers, they're open to change, then you work with them and help them get that opportunity. But some people, they're fixed. And if you're, if you're not bought into the company mission and you're fixed in your mindset, then, yeah, it's a nice thing if you're running a nonprofit or you're running a social service to sit around and help them. But remember, if you spend your energy on the individual who's too fixed and too stuck in their ways, it's against the culture, what you're really doing is you're hurting everybody around them. Hmm. So do you offer any insight into, like, I just want to hire the good ones so that I don't have to deal with that? Is there a way to find out in advance if somebody's going to fit and work with your culture? Absolutely. It's in your interviewing process. One of the biggest Mm -hmm. mistakes we make when we interview is that we look at a resume. Resumes, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, are largely irrelevant. You have to know if the person is capable, but we are all in the business world, and we know that the business world changed so quickly today that much of what you knew how to do five, ten years ago, you're going to need to change and adapt going forward. And learning competency is quick. When you sit in front of an individual to hire them, what I look for when I hire, I look for two Mm -hmm. qualities. And if these people have these two qualities, after a certain basic competence, I hire them. Hunger Mm -hmm. and humility. You've got to be hungry Mm -hmm. and humble. If you see mm-hmm. somebody that's not hungry, they're not going to grow. If they're not humble, they're not going to meld into the culture. And so when you, when you hire on values, the world will shift and your people will come with you. When you hire on skills or experience, what will happen is along the way, individuals with the wrong values will come in, and it's the values that build companies. It's not the experience. And when you start looking for that more and more and more, you, like, like everything, when, you, when you're in business, right, you're in real estate, you know that as you get into real estate, you get, more, you get much more keen on the nuances of what's a good investment, what's a bad investment, because mm-hmm. knowledge allows the nuanceical way of thinking. When you look for values and character of your employees, over time you get much better at sort of smelling and sniffing out who is the person that will fit and who won't. And once you've got the right people, you, get it. you can do anything. Hmm. Talk about um, diversity and inclusion in companies. So, the, and this it, it connects very much to diversity. I think one of the one of the challenges we have with diversity is that people think that the way you have diversity is through is through having a quota. Now, quotas are good because what quotas do is they create reinforceable behaviors. It's like if you want to lose weight, right? You got to do two things if you want someone wants to lose weight. One, you got to figure out why you're eating unhealthy. And two, you've got to create very strict rules now to start to change your mind. In the book, we speak about this idea of conditioning your mind to be different because of how one, one's mind works. So having quotas are important for the beginning, to start to force yourself to include a larger group of people into your company. But really, it comes down to mission-driven behavior. You see, if a company is mission-driven, 
They need diversity because diversity mm-hmm. is always going to bring perspectives that will make them better at the mission. If a company mm-hmm. says they're mission-driven but is really individual-driven, they're going to want people to look just like them. And so all the different things they're going to do, it's just going to go right back to the core of people that sound like them and agree with them and look like them. And so when you see diversity in the workplace, usually when I look at a company that's not diverse, it's really a company that's not clear with the mission that they're trying to accomplish and mission first. Because like any good sports team, you can't win a championship if you get the same players. So diversity really is the outgrowth of the proper values that a company has. Hmm. Awesome stuff. What is the number one takeaway that you hope readers get from reading your book, Unlocking Greatness? Your mind is flexible. It's called neuroplasticity. That means the way your brain works today with thoughts, you can literally change the structure of your mind. It sounds crazy. It's science. And no matter where somebody is today, they can, through doing certain things, changing their behaviors, visualization, rituals, it's all in the book, they can literally change the structure of their minds and change their lives. We are learning now in science today just how much change is possible for people at any age, at any point of their lives. And this is not just a motivational quote on someone's Facebook page. This is real hard scientific evidence. And if people understood how much they can grow and change, I'm hoping they they feel an empowerment to not let life be comfortable, but to push themselves to be more uncomfortable and to fight for greatness. Hmm. Great stuff. All right. I'm, thank you. While I was interviewing you, I ordered a copy of the book because I, oh, I think you. that as a <laughs> as a business leader, I would say it's so interesting because like I've gone on the um, tours of Zappos and I I like emulate Zappos and I have all of my staff members, my paid employees read books like that. But sometimes I, it blows my mind that you can offer all these things and then after they read the book, it drives me crazy when I hear somebody say, that's not my job. Like I'm like, how can you, after we've just been through all this and we just read this book and we say that our culture is about doing anything for any of our customers and our real estate agents, then to have somebody say, well, that's not my job. I don't yeah, understand oh. how to fix that. Yeah, well, and, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it can be conditioned and trained, and sometimes just not mm-hmm. fixable, right? That's, that's a lack of hunger and a lack of humility, right? That's mm-hmm. not my job. You, you just nailed it, right? Those, that one expression is, the, like you said, the worst expression in business because business is about right. giving value. That's not mm-hmm. my job, says... I am not humble enough to think that I can give more value to somebody else when it's not in my current job description, and I have no mm-hmm. hunger to grow and try something new. That those, and even if that person's good at their job, that way of seeing the world is going to get destroyed as the business world continues to get better and tighter and stronger. Because like you said, mm-hmm. business is just the ability to give more value than you're asking in, in payment. And the more people are focused on that and they get an enjoyment out of that, the more companies are going to grow and expand. And even if somebody else is smarter and this and that, in the long run, they won't make it unless their attitudes and their character is correct. Yeah. And I would also say that in most industries, including mine, which is real estate, like the playing field, it's so easy for anybody to open a brokerage and compete with the big guys day one. Like the only thing that differentiates companies is the culture. Absolutely. Yeah, and especially in in business like yours and anyone else who's hearing it to have businesses that are so interactive with people, today Mm -hmm. people need that connection. They want to feel when Mm -hmm. they go to bed at night that you have their back. And they'll pay Mm -hmm. more for someone who cares about them, right? To have somebody who actually thinks about you first – that's yes. worth much more money than the few dollars here and there for some, some that level of quality. And like your business and other businesses like that, your competitive advantage is mm-hmm. that's my job, right? That's, right. The, yeah. that's That line is what makes companies successful because as soon as someone feels like they're bothering their agent too much or yes. their agent doesn't yes. care about them because it's 501, they're thinking, mm-hmm. well, in that case, do they care about me to make sure they protect my interests? So to do, yes. it, it starts to open a cascade of other problems 
versus I'm here for you, whatever you need. And that person mm-hmm. feels like I'll do anything for them. I'll do anything to stay with them because where do I get that in life? In a world that, that we're right. getting more and more connected behind screens, like we're dying for somebody to really be connected to us. Hmm. And I'd also say that the issue of culture in today's day and age with Facebook and social media, like sometimes I feel like I want to have an authentic, really great culture. But then I see people from my own team posting stuff. And I'm like, even though when they're on my team, they seem like they match our culture. When I look at what they're doing on the outside world, I'm like, wow, are they really a match? Are they being inauthentic when they're here? So it's, that's a balancing act as well. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that we have, you know, I always say that I'm so happy that I grew up in an era before Facebook. Because if, if I, someone mm-hmm. documented my life when I was like, you know, high school and college, like, forget about it. But right. one, of these, one of the values that we have now is that we have the opportunity to see somebody in, a lot, in more ways than we ever did before. And, right. and to your point, being authentic is the hardest thing to find today and the most important mm-hmm. trait. And if you see someone that walks into an office and is one way, and then as soon as they walk out, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a real question mark, right? And we have right. now the opportunity when we hire people. And I tell companies all the time when I speak about this, when I go to the t- to retreats and stuff, take your time on hiring. We get this feeling mm-hmm. like, uh-oh, there's a need in the company. Get somebody in quickly because, you know, we need right. this and I don't want to do it. And they, they, you, it's like, you know, marriage, right? It's like so many things in life when you're building a relationship. Obviously, it's not the same, but it's similar. When you're building mm-hmm. relationships with people, it's so much better to go slow in the beginning and you mm-hmm. won't pay for it in the, in the back end. And right. pe- companies make this mistake. There's a little bit more work that, ha- that, that they have to do. They go running to hire somebody. They spend very few minutes really interviewing them, and they bring them on staff. Now they've got to deal with them versus right. slowing down, thinking about it, doing that level of research, asking them questions about their character, looking on the, and being able to have more of a rounded approach so when they mm-hmm. make that decision, they feel so comfortable. That person fits in both their skills, their knowledge, and their character. And when they – and by the way, in some of the greatest companies, to get in, the hiring process is so intricate. And it's because they know that each employee is so critical. One bad apple can ruin the dozen around right. them that it's, it's not worth it. And right. it's better to turn away clients and have less work than to have more clients and have employees that are ultimately going to ruin the, the feel and the culture of the organization. Absolutely. Wow, great stuff. Our guest today was Charlie Harari. His book is Unlocking Greatness. You can visit his website at unlockinggreatnessbook.com. Is that the best place for people to find your book, Charlie? Yeah, definitely. All right, awesome. Thank you for joining us today. It's an Thanks, honor. Charlie. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for this edition of Get Real. Tune in again next weekend for more.